Hey, it's Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Hello, hello. I'm here to talk about PCOS again, polycystic ovary syndrome. And I got so many great questions from you guys over the past few days that I wanted to answer your questions. In fact, I'm supposed to be writing my book right now. I'm working on book number five on the ketogenic diet and actually how to address problems like PCOS. I'm supposed to be working on that, but your questions are so good that I just wanted to record a short little video to get into some of the details. So we got a whole set of questions around, how do you make a diagnosis? How do I know if I have PCOS? Who does this diagnosis? Is it my OBGYN? Is it an internal medicine doctor? Is it a family practice doctor? Is it an endocrinologist? And so I wanna answer these questions and get into some of the details. So I wanna start first with what I look for as a gynecologist. I'm a board certified OBGYN and I've been taking care of women who have PCOS for uh, 25 plus years. And I'm looking for three things. We're gonna try to keep this as simple as possible, but as you'll see, it gets complicated kind of fast. And so I wanna make this as clear as I possibly can as we go forward. So the first thing that we look for is high androgen levels, high androgen levels. In medical parlance, that's hyperandrogenism. I've talked about this a lot in the last two videos because it's the high androgen levels that put women with PCOS at a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. In fact, that is the biomarker that we really have to keep our eyes on. So high androgen levels, that can show up in a couple of ways. You can measure a blood test, you can look at testosterone and free testosterone and DHEA, those are the things that I measure. And we're looking for an elevation. The second thing related to high androgen levels is to look for symptoms of high androgen levels. And there's two of those. One is acne and the other is uh, hirsutism. And that's where you have rogue hairs in places you don't want them. So the classic thing is on your chin, maybe on your upper lip, around your areola. And at my family, we kind of have a tendency to have these chinny chin chin hairs. Um, I don't know, maybe my French great grandmother. Uh, I have no idea where it comes from. But uh, what we know, especially for women as they get older with PCOS, we know that uh, what happens, and it's it's really kind of a crisis, is that you have more hairs where you don't want them, like here and here, and not enough hair here, like on your head where you want it. So if that's something that you struggle with, you wanna take a look at your androgen levels, your testosterone, your DHEA, and there's a whole family of different uh, hormones in this particular set. Androgens are uh, multi-system hormones that do a lot of different things. So yes, they grow, your chin hairs, and that's why men have to shave and have more facial hair than women. Um, but testosterone does a lot of other things in terms of libido, confidence, agency, muscle mass, and so forth. So that's the first thing that I look for, high androgen levels. The second thing I look for is a problem with ovulation. Now this can show up in a few different ways. It can show up as having a period that is more often than every 35 days. That's the criteria that we use in obstetrics and gynecology. So 35 days is considered the cutoff between normal and uh, what's called oligomenorrhea, so not getting your period regularly. So there's some women who go two months between a period or three months between their period, but there's also women who don't know that they have a problem with ovulation. So they may be getting their period every 32 days or every 33 days, but when you actually measure ovulation, they're not ovulating. A couple ways to do that. You can do it with an LH kit. Those of you who've tried to get pregnant and were peeing on a stick, that was LH, luteinizing hormone. The other way to do it is to look at your progesterone level after ovulation. So that's usually a day 21 or 22 progesterone level. And we're looking ideally for a level about 10 or higher. So. Okay, we covered number one, I'm looking for high androgen levels. Number two, I'm looking for any issues with ovulation, and that can be asymptomatic. That's one of the questions I got asked. And then third, we're looking for what's known as PCOS morphology. That's just a fancy word for doing an ultrasound and seeing if you have signs of polycystic ovary syndrome. And so I wore my lovely 
uh, chain of pearls here just to try to drive this point home. Here's what we're looking for on the ultrasound. And I've done like 5,000 of these, so I can tell you it's a pretty classic thing when you see it. So we're looking at the ovary of a woman with PCOS. The ovary tends to be a little bit enlarged. And on the periphery of the ovary, inside the sac of the ovary, is these little cysts. They're not big cysts. They're not, you know, 2.5 to 5 centimeters or greater. They're 8 millimeters on average. So they're these tiny little cysts all around the edge of the ovary. And what we know from the ultrasound studies is that a typical woman with PCOS has about 12 of these. So it's a grouping of these small cysts, kind of like a chain of pearls. So this is even called the, uh, the, uh, the pearl sign. So um, you're looking on ultrasound for this chain of pearl sound, uh, sign. Seems like there's another name of it, name for it. Pearl necklace sign, something like that. Anyway, I can't remember off the top of my head. So, okay, so those are the three different criteria. I'll just recap again. So number one, high androgen levels. Number two, an issue with ovulation, which you may or may not know about, but we can test you for it. Um, and then third, we're looking for this morphology on ultrasound, like the, the pearl necklace. So those are the three things we look for, but here's where things get complicated. And I, I have the slide deck that I developed for the Cleveland Clinic. I did a presentation for them last fall on PCOS. And so I, I pulled some of my slides for you and I just wanna share those with you. So the first thing I wanna share is that only about 60 to 80% of women with PCOS have hirsutism. So they have one of those signs of high androgen levels. So the thing that gets tricky here is that there's not one blood test. There's not one sign that says, yes, no, you have PCOS. The reason why this is called a syndrome is that it's a grouping of a number of different types of problems that women have. And that's what makes it hard to diagnose. In fact, 70% of women with PCOS are not diagnosed. It takes them an average of, I think it's seven years before they get accurately diagnosed. Another issue is it's definitely more common when you have obesity. So I think a lot of women with obesity are not diagnosed. That's another um, asymptomatic group. What we know is that one in three women with obesity have PCOS. But if you look at lean women, it's about one in 20 that have PCOS. So this is important because it depends on which criteria you use. There's a lot of different criteria to diagnose PCOS with total certainty. Um, there's the Rotterdam criteria, the National Institutes of Health. I use the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society criteria, and I can uh, share some of those with you in a moment. The other thing is we know that 80 to 90 percent of women who have irregular periods, so they have that term oligomenorrhea, they're going 35 days or longer in between their periods, 80 to 90 percent have high testosterone. And finally, 50 to 80 percent of PCOS patients have high testosterone and high insulin. And I'm gonna have to talk about insulin in a separate video. So I hope that you're understanding that there's this um, there's these three diagnostic criteria that I'm looking for, and that's part of the Androgen Excess and PCOS Society um, diagnosis. I wanna answer this other question, who diagnoses me? So I would say OBGYNs for the most part have the most experience with diagnosing you with PCOS. I certainly had a ton of education about it and I've kept up with the literature over the years. I have not met many internal medicine doctors and uh, family practice doctors who are comfortable diagnosing a patient with it, although there's certainly exceptions, especially those who tend toward integrative medicine or functional medicine. And I've only met a handful of endocrinologists who are really comfortable diagnosing this. One is Florence Comite in New York, an MD that I really admire. So I hope that answers some of your questions. I will keep answering them as we uh, proceed. I got to go work on my book now, but um, let me know below. If you have some questions, please like and share, and I'll, I'll see you next time. Have a fantastic day.